So Nelson is from the University of Michigan. He graduated there a couple years ago. Uh, he's a composer and very talented composer. And he also did his degree in music theory in undergrad. Um, and not only is he a performer composer, but he does many, many recordings for um, all artists all over Ann Arbor, um, especially for pianists. And he's also done recordings for the University Symphony Orchestra and the UPO Orchestra at the University of Michigan. And Nathan Fisher is your friendly neighborhood career advisor, recording specialist, um, friendly joke teller, trivia master, you know, what have you. He's always there for you. And if you have any questions about recording or grants or your resume, anything, I would highly recommend that you reach out to him because he's just a very warm and helpful person to talk to about anything re regarding you know, skills or career development. And he's gonna to talk to us today about audio video syncing because he's much better at those programs than I am, <laughs> which I'm grateful for. So um, we're going to turn over the first half of the workshop to Nelson, who was gonna talk about the recording process. And then Nathan will talk about that post-processing and what you need to do for that. Um, so can anyone, can everyone see the link that I put into the chat? Of the, of the handout, it's a PDF, it's on our blog. If you have trouble downloading it, just message me and I can upload it for you. But we're just gonna follow along with that handout for today. So without further ado, Nelson, take it away. Oh, I have to mention, I know you guys will have questions. Um, just for the sake of time, can we save that till the end? And then you can just ask away to your heart's content. Okay, sounds good. Great. Hello, everyone. Can everybody hear me? I just want to always want to double check that. It's always embarrassing when you start talking and nobody can hear you. I'm getting some nods. All right, that's good. So diving into this handout, um, part one is equipment. The first thing you got to do is get something to record yourself with. You can potentially use your computer. I advise against that just because a lot of times the computers can be kind of flaky, especially if an old one. It's much more stable to get a just handheld recorder that you can use. So if you scroll down to the second page, I have two different recommendations, the Zoom H1N and the Zoom H4N. I'll go on to which one you should get in just a minute. But um, in general, you want to record to its own dedicated device. That way you don't have to worry about your computer being finicky. Uh, they come in with built-in microphones that are really great quality. It's a great bang for your buck. You don't have to worry about you know hauling your laptop around or anything like that. Just highly recommend that over recording to computer. If you do want to record to computer, you can actually use these little recorders as, the, as your interface to the computer. Um, as for where to purchase equipment, which is what I have on the first page, uh, I highly recommend Sweetwater, especially for many of you are in, um, students at, at IU. Sweetwater is located out of Indiana, so you'll get your product super quickly because it's they're very sh fast with shipping and it's nearby. Um, if you're looking at more camera gear, uh, B and H is great. They tend to not um, ho have like the cheapest stuff, but the stuff that they do have is really good quality. And um, so it's not always, you know, it's a bit more expensive, but what's there is good, and their shipping is great. They have a good customer service. MPB is great for camera gear. It's a nice alternative to eBay. eBay is fine, but sometimes it can be always hard to know, you know, what you're getting on there is good or not. MPB is, I've had great experiences there. Amazon is again fine, but um, it's sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to find the, the quality stuff. There's a lot of copycats out there and it can be a little bit hard to know if it's the actual thing or not. So feel free to use Amazon if you know your way around and know what to look for in the reviews. I generally just try to avoid it. I find it much easier to get stuff from Sweetwater or B&H personally. Um, I've talked about the recorders. I'm doing that over the computer. The difference between the H1N and the H4N is the H4N has two little inputs on the back, on the bottom of it, where you can plug in an external microphone or potentially an external piano, uh, like a digital keyboard or something. That's kind of optional if that's something you want to do. I'll explain maybe why a bit later in the presentation, but that's kind of like a nice upgrade if you're thinking of maybe spending that extra hundred bucks for a little bit more flexibility. The Zoom H1N, very reasonable. It's pretty cheap and it can do a lot of stuff. It's it's what I recommend for most people just for the price. It's definitely the most bang for your buck, especially when you compare it to like USB microphones and things. It can do basically all of that stuff, but in addition to being stereo instead of a mono recording and you can take it on the go, you don't need your computer for. 
Um, you will need a stand to put it on. You can try to put it on a music stand. I highly recommend putting on a boom stand so you can get better placement, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, again, uh, that's listed. Uh, the stand I recommend is um, in the document. You'll need a little adapter so you can fit the zooms on it. They have a smaller thread size. Um, again, these are linked in the document. Just kind of covering this so you guys um, know. Cameras, your smartphone is great. I think for audition tapes and most other things, your smartphone is great quality. It's hard to really beat it. Even filmmakers discuss this. Um, I do in the documents go over a couple of other different options, some potential DSLRs that you can look at, um, as well as a Can Canon Vixia if you need to go longer. The biggest thing to look at for, out for in cameras, most people don't realize, is many cameras have a 30 minute recording limit. And that can get problematic, especially pianists. You might know there's list sonatas that go to 45 minutes and beyond. So you definitely want something that can record longer than 30 minutes if need be. Um, Canon Vixia is great because um, anything that's a camcorder will typically go over 30 minutes. DSLR cameras, anything geared more towards photography can get a little shaky. Uh, just make sure if, you're, if you want to, you, if you have a DSLR camera and you want to use it, just make sure you do your research before diving into that. So uh, I just want to, I know it was kind of going quickly. I don't want to bore people too much with gear. Any quick questions about gear or anything coming up? Um, I, cause I do want to spend most of my time talking about like the placement and lighting and things like that. Looking through. All right. So I think I covered it. Sorry for talking so quickly. I just wanted to briefly touch on that. Um, Feel free to reach out. Um, I believe my email it might be in some of the um, kind of advertisements for this and whatnot. Feel free to reach out to me. It's also on my website. But um, diving into the recording aspect, the most important part that you want to get right is the microphone placement that you can really nitpick between different microphones, but the difference is much more subtle compared to where you place it. And so just spending the time with your recording session when you're planning things out, if when you're recording yourself, take 10, 15 minutes to just go through and experiment with a couple different placements and find what's right for that session for the pieces that you're doing. It's gonna differ from room to room. It's gonna differ from piano to piano. Uh, if you're a wind player or a singer, you know, you'll wanna find a good placement for you. It's all gonna depend there isn't one size fits all. Um, I have in the document included a couple of ideas for pianists because uh, pianos tend to be a little bit more standard and just most of the people in this call, I believe are pianists. So the two that I've recommended is one is behind your head. So if I'm sitting at the piano behind me, looking down into like the hammers, it's um, nice and bright. It's very articulate. You can really get this nice um, sound. You can hear the sound go from left to right as you go from low to high on the keys. It's um, a nice sound. You might find maybe the hammer sound is a little bit too much. So I have the second position where it's in the, the curve of the piano. This is hard to demonstrate with my hands, but I feel like it's fairly clear in the document. The, uh, the little blue circles are where you'd place the recorder and I have the little arrows for kind of the direction that the microphone is looking at. Uh, in that position, you still get that nice left to right sound. It's a bit more resonant and warm. The biggest thing in both these positions is you don't want to be too low where it can't see the strings of the piano. Otherwise, it's very similar to just covering my mouth like this. It gets really dark and kind of muddy. You want to make sure you can see the source of where the sound is coming from, which is the strings. The other thing to watch out for is making sure that the recorder is not under the lip, which is very similar to me cupping my hands like this. You get like this stuffy sound as it kind of shoots it forward. It's great for the console hall because it sends the sound into the hall. But in terms of recording, when you're in that lip, you get that kind of microphone, not microphone, but megaphone like sound. And it's just stuffy and it's not the, the most full resonant sound of the instrument. From... Um, from there, just play around with it. It's going to depend from room to room. The bigger the hall, the further away you can be and get away with it. When you're in a smaller room, you want to make sure you're at least closer to the instrument than you are to the wall. Sometimes there, if you're in a smaller, like a classroom, it can be easy to you know, be the, have the microphone backed up against the wall. 
which you might find just it's a little stuffy sounding. Um, you, you have a hard time hearing the instrument. You're hearing a lot of the room and you're going to just want to get it closer. The smaller the room, more likely you are to be closer to the instrument and really getting a good sound. In a bigger hall, you have a lot more option to back it up and hear the full you know, reverb of the hall and everything that you want to hear in a big hall without it sounding strange or um, it is stuffy and just too far away. Again, take the time to experiment um, and as a general guideline, be closer to the instrument than you are to the walls. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, sorry. I'm sorry if I'm going a little too quickly. I have a tendency to talk fast, but um, I'm just double checking my document again. Oh, we I've, have oh, one yes. question from Young Gil. Oh. Yep. He's asking, would I want to put the mic closer to the instrument in a small room that is boomy, that is still boomy? In a small room that's still boomy. Um, you might want to play around. This is a little bit um, odd, but where you're, you are in the room, if you yourself are close to the wall, you might be reinforcing the low frequencies. Um, if the room itself is really boomy, at some point, you know, you, 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 the microphone is only capturing what's there. So it might be better to try to change it. Um, it's hard to say without being in that room to know the exact solution. I would play around with both. Try being closer and then try it a little bit further back. You know, just record four bars, listen back to it. Record four bars, listen back to it. That you know, Just taking the time to go through that 15 minutes or something at the start of the session and just finding what you think is the best for that room and your scenario. Um, that might be one of those things where the rare occasions where I would use a little bit of EQ just to compensate for what the room's doing. Uh, typically, I'm not doing any EQ after the fact in editing, but I would just play around with it. I think that might be one of the scenarios where a little bit further back is better, but probably still not closer to the wall than, the, than to the source. And Mallory was wondering, if you're a string player, specifically viola, should the mic be above or level with or below the instrument? The strings can get a little bit tricky if you're too in line with the F holes. If you have a brighter instrument, it can kind of have like this laser like sound. I would still be in front of it, but maybe a little bit more closer to the, um, the, the ebony, the fingerboard of the instrument. So that way you're not quite getting like too much bow scratching and things like that. Um, I think backing away will also help not being too close. Uh, but in generally still a little bit above. If it's below, you're just going to be missing some of the, um, the clarity that you'd get. Uh, trying to think of just any other scenarios. I think in general, still above, not being sure not to be too close, but not directly in line with the F holes. Um, and just, you, again, take the time to listen. If it's a little too bright, get it a little bit more indirect. That could be lowering it. That could be moving it off to the side. If it's you're finding it too dark and kind of nasally, then maybe moving it a little bit more in line with the F holes and where the sound is coming from. So any other questions? cropping up before I dive into video. So I'm going to move forward. Um, feel free to stop me, Elizabeth, if um, anything crops up audio wise. So with video, the two big things are just the angle. You want to make sure you have something that's still uh, within the guidelines of a competition or an audition tape. And you also want to make sure that things just generally look, look nice. The big things to consider for video is making sure that everything that you need is within the frame of the video. Um, at least the side of the face. Um, this is usually more for pianists because um, you want to be able to see the keys, but then also a face so you can recognize it is you. Um, the hands typically must be seen or whatever is used to for the play of the instrument, especially feet if you're on organ, but even feet on piano, oftentimes they want to see the pedaling and um, just making sure your instrument, a lot of times music stands can get very tricky if you're a bassoon player or something like that. Just taking the time to check your music stand positioning and making sure it's not blocking what your instrument's doing. You might have to adjust a little bit just for the recording session section recording session, making sure that the music stand is maybe a little bit further away than you'd normally be practicing with, just so that way the, uh, you know, everything can be seen. Playing around with angles, just taking, you know, the five minutes to make sure everything is good. Uh, I, I gave a couple of examples in the document specifically for pianists. Uh, these are kind of the two most common angles that really work and people like. 
Uh, the top one that I have is when everything is lined up with the very front of the keys. So it's a side on angle. You get a little bit more of the face, a little bit harder to see what the hands are doing, but um, you can really see what everything is going on. The second one is you may recognize as Rachel. Um, and that one's a little bit more from the back. You have a better idea of what's going on with the hands. You can really see the left to right a bit more, a little bit harder to see your face. You know, you might want to make sure your hair is back like Rachel's is. If it's running over your face, that might get problematic with an audition tape. Um, in terms of lighting, I, I'm just going to briefly go over this. The document goes a little bit in depth. Don't be overwhelmed too much about it. The biggest thing is just taking a moment to kind of look and seeing if the lighting is okay. You take a picture with your phone before you know. Uh, the biggest thing to watch out for, I'll demonstrate with my phone here, is with um, if you have an overhead light, a lot of times when it's like this, you can see I'm getting really dark raccoon -y eyes, you know, if I just had a, the ceiling light on and it just doesn't look great. Adjusting your positioning or potentially the positioning of the light to be a little bit more in front of your face and suddenly it's much more pleasing because it's filling out my entire face. If you're recording at home or like in a classroom, it might be worth turning off the overhead lights and maybe bringing in some lamps or something like that so you have more flexibility on where the lighting is and you can direct it more at you. Making sure if you can, try to be brighter than your background. It, it's always a little weird when, you know, there's this bright background and you can barely see you. It can be really hard sometimes. I know with like classrooms and things, there's not a whole lot of lights going on, but sometimes just turning off one of the, you know, sections of overheads in a classroom, or maybe there's like an extra, U of M has all sorts of fancy lights in all the classrooms. I never understood why they have so much, but it's appreciated when I go to do video because I can, you know, turn on one set of lights and turn off some others and get some nice lighting going. Uh, the other thing if you're at home is just watching out for things like curtains because uh, a lot of times they can color the light and you can look really pink just because you have some red curtains bringing in some red light. Uh, some people have colorful bedroom walls and everything's like this turquoise color. Just take some time to kind of be aware of it and see if you can combat it. Don't stress too much about it, but I just wanted to cover the many aspects that you could think about um, in terms of lighting. I also gave a link to a YouTube video by um, Indie Mogul. They do a really good job at explaining some video concepts in a way that's easy to digest, even if you're not a videographer. Any questions so far of everything that I've covered? I'm getting a little bit short on time, so I just want to make sure anything coming up now. Okay. I'm going to dive in a couple of these um, other considerations real quick that's in the document. Uh, I gave my technical specs that I usually record with. Some people really stress out about recording at different sample rates and things like that. I gave what I did just so you don't have to worry about it. Don't stress about this too much. It really makes a small difference. But if you're wondering, you know, if like, oh, I don't have enough space to record at this really high fidelity thing, don't worry about it. Biggest thing is I wouldn't record with MP3. Some of the Zoom recorders have that option to record directly to MP3. I would record to a WAV file. It, you'll, it'll make your life easier. The difference sometimes can be small but that would be the biggest thing out as far as technical specs to watch out for. Chamber performances can be tricky to record because you have several different instruments. The biggest thing to keep in mind is your mic distance, making sure that everybody is roughly the same distance from the microphone. The easiest way to do this is by creating more distance because then it averages out a little bit more. Uh, if you have, you know, one, like some person is six feet from the microphone and then other person's more like 12, especially that'll be tricky with all the social distancing. That person that's six feet is going to be almost twice as loud as a person that's 12 feet. So if you can back up the, the microphones a bit more so it becomes more like 12 and 18, suddenly that volume difference is going to be much smaller. So just play around with that, making sure that one person's not too close. I see a lot of people will just set the Zoom recorder right at the front of the ensemble, and suddenly that front row of players is much louder than the back row of players. If you back it up a little bit more, you'll, the front to back volume will be much more consistent, and you don't have to worry about the people in the back really playing fortissimo just to be heard. So any um, questions here? I do want to touch briefly on recording with electronic keyboard. Uh, Elizabeth, you said there are some singers in the group. I haven't touched on them very much. Is I that, think is that so, correct? yeah. Okay. So if singers, you have specific questions about that, feel free to just put them in the chat anytime. Mm. One thing I will say um, that I come across when I record singers a lot is taking the time to know the boundaries of the video. 
um, where, where you step out of frame. I know a lot of times with singing, there's a certain degree of acting and being in character and a certain degree of moving around and just making sure that you know, you know, in advance how far you can move or backing up the camera. So that way you have more space to move around if the performance needs that. I also recommend if anybody's having their performances recorded, let your engine, like work this out with your engineer in advance. It's always annoying when, you know, I try to guess, you know, how much they're going to move and, and, you know, they were planning on really u using the entire stage. So if you are planning on moving around a lot, let me know. So I don't have, you know, people like myself don't have to do as much camera work. Um, it will, will appreciate it. Um, just going to wait a little bit for any more potential video questions, and then I'll dive into the, uh, a little bit on using electronic keyboard to record with that. This is also helpful for people doing Zoom lessons or any virtual lessons with students. I actually had a question about the boomy room situation. Yeah. Um, do you think adding curtains or any other kind of thing would help a lot with that? Or any other like DIY things that you can do to combat yeah. that? Curtains, probably not. If anything, that actually has a chance to make the problem worse uh, because in order to absorb lo low frequencies, you really have to get a lot of material, like actually for really low frequencies, several feet. So unless you're going to put like a mattress or something up on the walls that might record, you know, gets rid of some of the low mid frequencies, it's probably not going to do much. And if anything, it might make it worse because you're going to absorb more high end in comparison to low end. So with that, I would actually play around mostly with your positioning in your room and possibly even steps at the instrument, you know, um, just playing a little bit brighter. I, I hate to mention that, but it's sometimes you do have to go through some of the settings if you're in a uh, lackluster recording environment. Um, I'm trying to what think if there's anything else. Dry super dry. Uh, I would, in a super dry scenario, being a little bit further back, like if you're in your living room, I say you can be a little bit further back than if you were in a, a large hall. And the inverse, if you're in, you know, some, uh, there's a one hall, or organ hall at U of M that is just all tile from floor to ceiling, everything. It's incre incredibly reverberant and you're going to want to be much closer recording in a hall like that than if you were in something that has cushioned seats and, you know, some curtains on the walls. Um, Find what is right for you. It's also a matter of taste. There are some pianists that really like, you know, a lot of reverb in their sound, and there's some that like a very dry, articulate sound. Uh, do what's right for you, because I can't subscribe everything. But in general, playing with that placement, the closer you are, the drier it's going to be, and the more further away, the more wet and reverb it's going to be. So any other questions crop up? Okay, I'm going to dive in this briefly about the using an electronic keyboard. Um, so most electronic keyboards, MIDI keyboards, they have some sort of output, usually labeled line out, and that's just sending the inbuilt piano sounds out through um, basically like your headphone jack, but at a higher volume for recording. Um, in my uh, document, I've listed the two most common output jacks and what the cable that you'll need. And that, that can, you can use this to plug directly into, you'll need the Zoom H4n. Um, you can plug into the bottom jacks of that. You'll need to make sure on the Zoom to set up that it knows to look for those inputs and not just the microphones built into it. But um, you can just plug that directly in and then you can connect it to your computer. And then you could use that as potentially like a microphone for a Zoom call. And you could have you know your piano going into your laptop and then a potentially a phone is set up in a Zoom call. So you could be talking with the phone and then you have, you know, your, your laptop sending the audio so you can hear the high quality sounds there. The other thing that, um, that you can do is use a USB cable. This, not as many have this, but it's still common for electric, electronic keyboards to have a USB output or a MIDI cable output. The MIDI is a little bit odd, but it's usually labeled MIDI out and it's got a bunch of little uh, prongs in it. Um, but you just can plug that into your computer. If it's USB, it should recognize pretty easily. Um, if it's, you'll just need to get the correct cable that I, I listed the most common one in the document. If it has the MIDI connection, you can get a MIDI to USB cable and that'll work the same way. Uh, 
The tricky thing with that, if you're using MIDI, is you'll have to go from the MIDI sound into something like GarageBand or Reaper or something like that to create the piano sounds and then out of GarageBand or Reaper into Zoom, Skype, or whatever you plan to use for audio. So you'll have to route it within the computer. The best way to do that if you're on Mac is using Soundflower. It's fairly simple to use once you get used to it. Um, on Windows, you can use Jack. I am not a Windows user, so I've used it once. I struggled a little bit, but I did figure out and it wasn't too bad. Um, there's, there's a couple of instructions on YouTube and thing on how to use this. Um, again, you can always email me if it's, you know, you're struggling in the moment. I now I might not be able to respond if within the hour, but I'll try to, you know, respond within a reasonable time. So that would be the two recommendations in terms of that. Uh, again, if you plan to use the audio outputs, you'll just need to make sure you get the H4N and not just the H1. Any, any questions overall of everything that I've covered? Um, it was a lot to go over, so I spoke a little quickly, but I just want to make sure. Any questions, feel free. So Jinju is asking, can I use a Zoom H4N as a microphone when I take online lessons? Yes, you, you can do that. Um, it will, in Zoom, it should be an option once you have the, um, oh, this is going to come confusing, on Zoom the software, when you have your Zoom recorder plugged in, uh, you'll, you, you can change your microphone in the bottom left to change between, you know, like an external like microphone like I have and the, your inbuilt laptop microphones. So yeah, you can use it as an interface. You could record directly to Audacity or GarageBand. You can use it for your Zoom lessons and um, you can also record to it separately. And Caroline is asking, any audio recording advice specifically for singers? The video recording advice was great. Audio specifically, um, taking some time to test the balance between your pianist and yourself. Um, a lot of times when you're standing directly in front of the piano, you hear it really well, but you don't recognize that singers are actually quite loud and it's very easy for the, uh, to overpower the pianist potentially. Um, so especially if it, that might not be an, too much of a problem if it's only you that's being judged in the audition tape, but if it's maybe for like a concert, some uh, recording to show to your professor, you might want to show up, you know, a better balance. Sometimes it's actually better to be full stick in a recording. Uh, that might be, a, you know, a little bit of a shell shock at first, you know, uh, getting blasted full stick by, um, by the piano, but it does end up being a little bit more balanced. Maybe you can hold back a little bit in the recording, playing around with the microphone placement as well, trying to be a little bit more further back when you're two steps in front of it, you can be that extra loud bit louder. So just making sure a little bit more back than maybe you might think if you're, or just what you would do on your own. And then I would avoid being exactly head height because you might get a little bit too much of the S sounds. So you might want to make sure you're a little bit above so that way that of your S's don't get too loud because those can really cut through quickly in a recording, especially if you're too close. So again, being a little bit further back and being a little bit higher than you would be if it was just piano or you on your own. So let me know if that um, that answered your questions or if you have any any other thing that you were worried about. I'm happy to answer. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, LA is asking any recommendations for mic placement for woodwinds. Woodwinds. The biggest thing is don't be too close. Um, as you're probably familiar with, the sound comes from different areas on the instrument. It rarely comes through just the outside hole. So making sure you're not too close to it so that way the entire portion is being covered. And then being aware of the, the different instruments, if you're in like a woodwind quintet, uh, the different placements, making sure you're yeah, balanced in some way that, um, you know, flute where it comes out for a flute is different for a bassoon, which is different for clarinet, et cetera. Uh, just taking some time to, again, record a snippet and then listen and be like, okay, the oboe seems a little loud and maybe get a little bit closer to the flute and further from the oboe. Typically, just being a little bit further away balances everything out in a chamber setting and just making sure that you're not too close so that way one note doesn't some, suddenly get much louder. Um, apart from that, it's fairly similar to anything else with, um, I know you mentioned woodwind instruments, but with brass, the one thing to keep in mind is 
you, you're probably aware of this, but the sound coming directly out of your bell is not the most pleasant sound. So actually being um, on the other side of the instrument, like, you know, like where the camera is facing typically will get a better sound because you're getting what's reflecting off the back wall and, or the top wall if you're a tuba. And that typically is much better if you're a trombone or a trumpet player, uh, not being directly in front of the bell, but just off to the side a little bit. We'll cut back on the super high frequencies and make it sound less like a Dixieland jazz record and more classical and a warm, you know, the warm sound that we want from classical and less so like a sousaphone or anything like that. Um, there's a question from Dahi about the Zoom H4N and the Zoom H1. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the differences between those when recording or using as a microphone? For the most part, basically the same. From my understanding, they have the same internal circuits um, and the and the same microphones. I can't say without actually being someone that works and makes them at Zoom but they're fairly identical. The biggest difference with the H4N is that it's going to have a longer battery life, more powering options, and it's uh, and it has the external inputs that you can use. So you could potentially re record like a guitar or just any other microphone you can pl plug directly into it and the Zoom will power it, but the sound is coming from the microphone. That's the main difference between the two. Uh, trying to think if there's anything else. I think for most classical recording purposes, the, as far as the microphones are concerned, they're fairly similar, if not the same. Any other last questions before we move on to audio video syncing? Now is your chance. And we, we can probably take a few questions at the end as well. Yeah, I'll stick around for uh, Nathan's portions as, as well. So if there's something comes up while he's talking about it, makes you think about the recording aspects, I'll be here to chime in for that as well. Okay, thank you so much, Nelson. That's so You're helpful. Welcome. And um, a reminder to everyone in the handout, you have Nelson's website where you can go to contact him for any consultations or recording or editing of your recording that you would like. Um, now let's take it over to Nathan Fisher, who is going to show us the ins and outs of Adobe Premiere. Sounds good. How's everybody doing? Um, perfect. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just going to show you that I um, today I'm, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit of video and audio synchronization in Premiere Pro. I use this Canon Vixia HFG50. It's about an $1,100 Handycam. It records in 4K. It, is, uh, it, it belongs to the OECD office, so you guys can actually probably use it too. Um, and then following in line with Nelson's, um, I used the Zoom H1N here and the Zoom H4N. And those are the two um, external mic inputs that you have. So we're going to have a little test with um, the audio from the camera, the audio from the H1N, and the audio from this one. I already know the answer, or I have my opinion already formed, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll try not to give it away. All right, so... Um, so the first thing I would say is, like, after you're done with your recording, I would... Uh, recommend that you just create on your desktop a file, and this is my MTNA demo. And what I would do is put all of your files here and that you're planning on using for your demo um, or for whatever your, you know, whatever project you're working on. In this case, we're doing a video synchronization of external audio and video for like, you know, a competition uh, pre-screening or a an audition for your graduate or undergraduate degree, right? Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is open Premiere Pro and I'm going to click on new project and I'm going to go here and I'm going to type in, um, you know, uh, competition demo 2020B and then what I will do is go here and um, pick the drive that I wanted to go in. So I wanted to go into this MTNA folder and I'm gonna click choose and that's it. I'm not gonna mess with any of this other stuff and just hit okay. Now by default, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro will save your files in a predetermined Adobe Premiere Pro file location and 
if you're not familiar with the program and you're just kind of getting off the ground with it, I promise you it's like the most impossible place to find for some reason, you know. So it's a really good idea to just make sure that you save it to like a desktop, you know, make sure you're putting all of your project elements, assets into the same uh, folder. All right, so down here we have a project panel. Um, and this is where we're going to import our media. That's where we're going to like basically bring all of our, you know, audio and video files and hold them there. This is a source monitor panel. We're not using this today. Um, this is your program monitor panel, which is basically like watching that. This is the TV screen. This is where you're going to watch things unfold. And down here's your timeline panel. And this is where you were going to do all of our editing. So if you've used iMovie and you've used any of these other types of programs, they're all kind of the same, but they're just slightly different. So mostly we're going to be using these two and we're going to be looking up here. So to import the media, there's a few different ways to do this, you know, and it just depends on your style. I can, uh, I could just go to the folder. Where's my folder right there. I can double click on it to open it up. And then I can just click on the elements that I want and then I can just drag them in and that works too. Um, you can click, you can select multiple files if you want. You can go to file, you can go to import and do it that way. Um, you can double click on this and that opens the import window. Or you can just hit command I, which is the keyboard shortcut and that also pulls it up. Um, so then you have to navigate to your folder and we are going to pull in three files. I'm going to pull in uh, a piano file and then my two WAV files, H1N and H4N, and just import them. And they're going to just pop in right here. Now your audio files are going to be green like that and your video files will have this black. And then you can sort of um, scrub or test them out, just kind of, you know, so if there's multiple video files in here and you know that in one of them you raise your hand, you can just kind of scroll over it and it'll, it'll show you that one. So this is where it gets easy. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take that and we're going to drag it in to that file. And that's, that's what we have. You know, this is the piano video. Now you can see the wave forms of the audio that was taken and captured by the camera right here. Um, so you can see that we have a lot of dead like silent noise going on right here up until about this point. And so I'm just going to move the cursor up just before the audio starts and I'm going to hit the space bar and that's going to enable us to Okay, so um, this, 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 this little thing down here will help you expand and contract the um, clip that you see down here. You can just click, uh, click on the clip and it highlights it in that white and you can just kind of move it around. Um, and you shouldn't be afraid to play with it. You're not gonna ruin anything. Um, if you click in the black, it deselects that. So the first thing I want to do is grab this H1N wave file and I just want to grab it and throw it down here and, you know, let it sort of take a moment to, where is it? Oh, okay. So it starts back there. Um, if you hit the minus sign on your keyboard, you zoom out. If you hit the plus sign, you zoom in. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit and, um, kind of line these guys up like this. Um, now, this is all dead space right here. So we can, we, we will clip this. But what I'm gonna do right now is show you how to align these two clips. All right, so hold on to your seats. I know everybody's very anxious about this. You know, it is, there's no clapping, there's no, you know, no fancy stuff. So um, I collect, uh, uh, select one, uh, the audio clip or the video clip, holding shift, click on the other one so that they're both highlighted. And then I'm gonna right click or I'm gonna hit control click um, with a Mac. And I'm just gonna hit synchronize. I'm gonna hit okay. And they're synchronized. Your audio and video is synchronized. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna 
get go again to where the audio s starts, audio waves, and I'm just going to mute the video clip, and I'm going to hit pl hit the space bar to play. The space bar is play and stop, right? And I okay. So now we're hearing the H1N, which is a uh, a slightly more focused thing, but it's a bit soft. I had the levels down a little bit. And so what I want to do is I want to raise the, the, the volume. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to right click again. I'm going to highlight just the uh, audio, um, right click or control click with a Mac and go to audio gain. And then I'm just going to go up here to set gain to, I don't know, I already know it's about eight. So I'm just going to hit eight and I start peeking out and getting really loud right here. So where those where those spikes happen in the sound wave, that's where you want to check and make sure that you're not going. See, it peaked, all right? I was wrong. It's not eight. So I'm going to go back to audio gain, and I'm just going to change that to seven. I'm just going to keep playing around with it. Click on that to make it go away. So that sounds good, right? All right, so you guys want to hear the difference between the H1N and the H4N, of course, right? Um, so we're going to drag that in there. And now, if I'm just going to click on this one to highlight it, hit Shift, click on the next two, so they're all highlighted, right click or control click with a Mac, and I'm going to go to synchronize, and I'm just going to hit OK, and they're all synchronized now. and then what I'm going to do is go here and I'm going to mute the H1N and we're going to hear the H4N. Okay, so the problem with that again is it's a little soft. So I'm going to highlight it, audio gain. I'm going to go here and I'm just going to put about six decibels up and I'm going to start it again. And then we hear all three of them, right? And we're peeking. So um, I know that through the Zoom camera, you probably won't be able to tell very well which one is better. So I'll just tell you that from my perspective, sitting here behind my audio console, the H1N sounds pretty much exactly the same as the H4N. If you're going to buy an H4N, you're going to be buying it for all of the cool things that it can do. And it can do a lot of cool things. So um, as far as sound is concerned, though, I, there's not much of a, a difference, not that you're going to notice. And so, okay, so we have all of this dead clip here that we need to get rid of, and we need to clean up the back end, too. So what I'm going to do is take this um, cursor, and I'm, gonna, I'm just doing this loosely today. You know, you, you can get in and practice placing it in a, so that you have enough time from the start of your video. So, okay, that felt about right. Maybe maybe it's a little too much. That's all right. So I'm just gonna use this blue marker to clip all of these at the same time. So I'm gonna highlight them. I'm going to shift, click each one. They're all highlighted. And now I'm gonna hit Command K or Control K. And these are all split from this side. And then I just hit Delete and they're gone. And then I'm going to zoom out. I'm going to go over here to the back end, and I'm just going to wait. She looks at the camera. It's a great, great moment to 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 clip away. I don't know. You know, I, you you determine it on your own. And because the line is right there, I'm just going to hit Command K and highlight those, and that's cleaned up. Now I will just highlight everybody and I'm just going to move it to the beginning. I'm sure there's some shortcut for doing that, but I haven't found it. So now they're at the beginning. Um, I have decided personally that I'm going to go with the H1N. I would put it up to a vote, but we don't have that much time. So I'm going to go ahead and mute the audio that came with the video camera. I'm going to highlight the H4N, which I think we don't need for this demo. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete that out. Um, just to clean it up. And I'm going to give it one more listen. Hit enter to go put the cursor at the beginning. All right. I'm pretty happy with how that's worked out. Now, for the sake of this um, 
tutorial, what I'm going to suggest is to bounce out your video as an MP4 into your project folder. The reason for that is that you can then have the power to upload that to your YouTube page. But also, if you're working with certain sites like Get Accepted for your competition or for your application, you have to upload the MP3 into that site. Um, they don't always let you use a link to your YouTube. So um, it's good to have that have those videos, those super polished, super great videos um, available on your you know uh, external hard drive or safe somewhere. So in order to do this, um, as a precautionary, I take I go to the beginning and I hit I, and then I go to the end here and I hit O. And that just tells the computer that this is the area, the region in which we're going to bounce out, right? And so what I want to do is I'm, there's two ways to do this. You can go to File, Export, Media, right? Or you could just hit Command M or Control M. And again, I'm, I'm a shortcut kind of person. So when you hit Command M, that um, export dialog, export settings uh, window pops up. Sorry, I keep calling it dialog box today. I don't know why. It's just stupid. So for today's video, I just keep it at H.264 and just keep match source high bit rate. You'll be fine. Um, and then you have to click on this output name and we're going to put Miano, uh, Mireya Frutos Piano B. Um, I've got to go to my desktop, to my MTNA folder, and I'm going to bounce it here. You can see I've been rehearsing a lot. and um, that's it. Go here to export. Q sends it to a totally different program, which is also like a whole nother discussion for another day. And, you know, media encoder is a great thing. But if you hit export, you're done. So in 20 minutes, you can, you can get really great audio and align it with your video. And you can export it. And that's that. So I'm gonna to go to my um, project folder now. And it takes a while to bounce. So I'm gonna show you the one that, this is the one that I did earlier. It's practically the same. And hit play. Oh, I didn't edit, sorry. Maybe that's not the one I did earlier. Oh, the bounce, sorry. This is the one I did. I just realized, did I share my sound with you guys? Yes. yes. Yeah, I did. You can hear that? Okay. Yes. Now, I didn't, I wasn't as careful about my mic placement as like Nelson, you know, I should have read his tutorial because my mic was a little bit too close to the wall and I didn't, I, I didn't take you know, as much time as I should have for this to like do some different placements and to check my settings. Really, I, I let it ride around negative 10 to negative 12 dB and it, it came out a bit soft. And so you have to play with it. And once you get it, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, you, you know, you just got to get in and kind of get your feet wet. So before I don't know. Does anybody have any? Does anybody have any comments or questions? That one thing. Bef wait before you ask. <laughs> um, if I go back to my export settings box here, I just wanted to show you this. I, I told you guys to use this match source high bit rate, but if you click down on this, you can actually export specifically for like Vimeo or specifically for like YouTube. Um, or for Facebook, you know, it's it's pretty sophisticated in that way. So if you want to make your performance video and you want to export it specifically to look great on your Facebook page, this program can do that. And that's a very, very nice feature. I just thought I would point that out. If you don't mind if I chime in real quick, I had a couple of things come to mind that I might want to share with you guys, uh, um, kind of to elaborate on thing, what Nathan was talking about, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so you were kind of mentioning that you recorded kind of quiet. That is actually something I forgot to touch on, but it's much better to record too quiet than too loud. If it distorts, 
there's not much you can really do about it if it's too loud. If it's too quiet, you can always bring it back up. It's really hard to get, it, these days all the recorders and stuff have a lo really low noise floor is what it's called. So if you've ever heard like the hiss in the backgrounds that was with old equipment, that hissing was really, you know, pretty loud. And these days that hissing sound is so low, don't worry about it. As long as you can see the signal showing up in the meters, you're probably fine. So don't worry about having to bring it up, you know, 12 decibels. I do that all the time. I routinely record too quiet because I don't want to make it distort because, I mean, we all know that just sounds awful. That's not what your instrument is supposed to sound like. Um, another quick thing on the, uh, the topic of bringing volume sounds up, I believe, Nathan, if you can demonstrate this in uh, Premiere, I think when in the audio gain settings that you're mentioning, there's a way to just kind of do it like one click and automatically have it at the the setting you want. I think that, yeah, normal, the third one down, normalize max peak two. And if you set that to negative one, it will just look through your audio, audio and be like, oh, there's the loudest point and we'll put it at negative one. You have no chance of clipping and it will just bring it up. It doesn't matter if you're 18, doesn't matter if you're 12, you know, decibels below, it will bring it up right to where you need to. So that'll, that'll take some of the guesswork out rather than trying to figure out where it goes, um, you know, exactly how much. And then um, the other thing in terms of just some guidelines and suggestions for when to stop and start your video, I found as just like a really quick guideline uh, for when to start it with, within five seconds. Sometimes if there's a lot of dead space, your professors, or whatever, are just kind of waiting for you to start. So make sure it's, you know, there's leave five seconds. I find the moment that you're about to, for pianists, the moments you're lifting your hands up is a really nice spot. So you start just like a split second before it. So they press play, your hands come up, they rest on the keys, you pause a second, and then you start the piece. If you wait, sometimes, you know, you rest and kind of really get your energy on with your hands on the keys. I would just start, you know, while your hands are on the keys, you know, a couple of seconds, and then you just start the piece. Um, in terms of when to stop, I always look for the moment that you kind of break character that, you know, you're in the moment you're recording and you put your hands down and then just, you know, when you kind of look or whatever, I just stop it right before you break character. And when you're recording, just kind of remember to always hold the moment at the end. It always feels much longer than it actually is, you know, just, you know, count to five or something like that. So you have plenty of room after the fact, but that would be just kind of my general guidelines. You can also, the pianist hand things also works great for chamber performances and also singers that, you know, that, that's kind of like the, the start of like, we're getting ready to perform and it's always a good part to just part to stop the start the video. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, I have to mention Nathan couldn't see the chat because he was sharing his screen, but when you did the synchronized feature, people kind of exploded in the chat. <laughs> They're like, I can't believe this is so easy. So really thank you for showing that to us. Okay, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat now. I do have a couple of questions that I want to zoom through because we have some, we have like six minutes left. And hopefully we can go over by just a couple of minutes if there are a lot of questions. I just wanted to also say you guys have access to uh, Premiere Pro for free through iuware.iu.edu. Uh, and if you go there, you can download the Creative Cloud and you get that for one year after you graduate, but you'll be hooked. I'm sure you're gonna subscribe to Adobe at that point. Yeah, get those student perks. I'm all about those. Um, so Robert has a question for Nelson. Um, do you have any experience with Zoom recorders that have video cameras built in and would you recommend it or do separate video audio devices yield better quality? I prefer to do separate audio and video simply because uh, typically where looks best isn't where sounds best if that makes sense. Uh, so I just prefer the separate ones. I don't think there's anything technically wrong. I think all the video specs and audio specs are great on both. I just prefer to separate them just because you can get a great placement sound wise. You can get a great placement video wise. Rarely do they overlap. And so it just gives you more flexibility. Um, if you have one, feel free to use it. Um, it might be worth getting an H1 in addition to that. So you can use the, that Zoom recorder for the video purposes and then you can sync later. Again, there's nothing technically wrong with it. I just find that flexibility helps you to yield the best result because then you have the most flexibility with placement. Um, and then Dahi was wondering if you want more resonance after you finish your recording, is it possible to put more echo through Adobe Premiere or any other program? Maybe both of you can, I don't know who, which one of you wants to take this one. Yeah, I can chime in quickly first. I'm sure it's definitely possible in Premiere. Nathan can probably show you how. 
I typically shy away from that, at least when there's video involved. It's always a bit strange when you see a small classroom and then you hear this big hall. So you can add a little bit and get away with it. But um, a lot of times I think professors really appreciate just the, the willingness to be authentic with it. And just like, this is me playing in a classroom. You know, the professors can, and anybody judging a competition, they can tell the difference between, you know, someone playing well in a dry room and someone playing poorly in this big reverby space. And so just, you know, having the willingness to be like, this is me in this moment playing and, you know, let them judge that. I know it always sounds better. Yes. From a fidelity standpoint to have that nicer room, but from a standpoint of like an audition tape or, you know, a concert recording to show your professor, I think just, you know, the willingness to let the natural moment be there is good, but yeah, you can totally add that after the fact, Nathan, I'm not sure if you want to demonstrate. I'm not sure, but I missed it. What, what, I, sure. Demonstrate what? <laughs> Adding reverb basically. Oh, and no, I don't do that. I would never do that in Premiere Pro. So I, uh, I have to say, like, I would take the audio. If you want to walk me through it, I'd be happy to. Um, but I, I, I don't know Premiere very well. I am a Final Cut user, but I'm sure there's a, typically a spot where um, you could add, like, audio effects, and usually it would be under that point. I'm not sure if there's a spot. It's usually near the video effects where you can do all the crazy rainbow colors and make your head oh, look wait, like I a giant it. alien. I found it. I found yes. it. Okay. So shall we do it? Go ahead. Um, okay. Yeah, let's see your um, screen. I have to do this quick. Um, okay. Wait, no, uh, I did it again. No, this whole time I wasn't sharing my audio. So now I will be. Okay. So basically I went up here to, and I clicked on effects right here and it brings up this drop down list and you click on audio effects and it, amplitude and compression, delay and echo, blah, blah, blah. We want reverb and I don't know, you pick convolution. Convolution will be more intensive on your computer, but typically will sound better. All right, let's do that. You just take it and you drag it and drop it on. And then let's give it a listen. Sorry, hold on. Yeah, it's there. Now I messed it up. Okay. Um, I mean, it's showing there. I don't really hear much of the reverb. I don't know. What do you guys think? It's hard to tell um, without, you know, hearing it. It's, I've been hearing it through Zoom, so it's a little bit spot. But I'm sure there's a spot where you can adjust the parameters. Again, I don't know Premiere well enough. Um, I'd have to play around with it, but that's interesting. Um, oh, I just noticed uh, Colin's question. Yeah. Um, using a DAW, that, that would might make it easier. In my personal workflow when I'm doing recordings for other people is I bring the audio into Pro Tools. I do all my edits and sound mastering, bringing up the volume, any you know really small adjustments, and then export that out and then bring that into Final Cut and sync the two. So I do all the audio edit editing separately, partially just because I'm doing a little bit more of like a kind of professional grade work. There's nothing wrong with just working right with the raw audio. But if you want a bit more flexibility, it'd probably be easier to just bring it into a DAW re-export and then do the synchronization in, uh, in a Premiere or Final Cut. Yeah. So what 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 you have here is you you have your settings for the convolution reverb here, and then when I clicked on this, these are all the presets. So you can sort of select different. If I if I bypass it, now it's not working. So without reverb, that's pretty cool. I uh, I normally would have um, 
what I would do is I would take my audio and I would put it into Pro Tools and I would actually, you know, get the audio sounding like the audio that that's how I would do it. And then I would import that into Premiere Pro and then just sync it and be done. Anyways. Okay, one, one other question. What kind of elements can we alter or improve through Premiere Pro so that my recordings from home would sound professional? Um, because of the school's requirement saying that I need to submit a video of my recital with good sound that matches the qualities of recordings from school. Um, can I reduce, how can I better reduce background noise or make the sound quality brighter? So I think um, in terms of doing stuff after the fact, it's, al it's always a bit more repair work, more so than improving it. I think the best thing that you can do if you really want to get the best sound is take more uh, time up front to maximize it. You can, you, you can only shape what you're already working with, and it's very, very difficult to take you know, an apple and make it sound like an orange sort of thing. It's best to just you know, really work with it and know what you want it to sound like and experiment. So you know, try to get extra time in the hall if you can, or whatever it needs to be done to just get that extra time to mess with the, the settings. Um, in terms of video, I think just taking the time, all, you know, to make sure it's bright enough. Sometimes if you maybe you're in it, like the lighting is good, but it's a little dark and you, you know, there's settings in a uh, premiere and final cut where you can just make it a bit brighter or a bit more colorful. Uh, don't be heavy handed would be my biggest suggestion because oftentimes being heavy handed sounds worse than what, than what was already there. Uh, that would be my biggest suggestion is it's very easy to go overboard. Um, and just, you know, if you're unsure, be err on the side of caution. Nathan had to run off to another meeting, but I want you guys, I want to encourage you guys to, if you have questions about this or any other kind of um, topic that was covered, you can definitely email him. His email's in the ha handout, and you can also contact Nelson for consultations. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, it's, it's really it's really nice for me to just to see everyone's faces too, some faces I haven't seen for a long time and um, some new ones as well. Uh, we really hope this workshop was helpful for you. It definitely was helpful for me and I'm hoping to incorporate some of that in my own work. So thank you so much, Nelson, for being here. Uh, again, you guys should visit his website and if you're ever in Michigan, definitely ask him to record for you because obviously he's a pro. He's, he's the go-to guy in Michigan. All right, so with that, have a great rest of your afternoon.